So we want to talk to you today um, about a different kind of computer, and that's the one that sits between your ears, because as you're doing your forensic examinations, um, I think everyone in this room would agree that that is both the most important computer and the limiting factor sometimes, right, in keeping up with everything we have to keep up with and in doing um, the work we do every day. Whether it's the hard nature of what we're dealing with content-wise or whether it's trying to jam another fact into your brain and then use it later, this is hard work. So we've been talking about this for a long time. Ryan and I met 2012? in 2012 at some forensics event. We are debating which yes, one. I was giving a keynote. It was yeah. either Stranger in a Strange Land or it was about elephants. Um, but also about forensics. And afterwards, um, I came to talk to his class of students. And I'll let you take it from there. Uh, so I'm an adjunct professor at Champlain College in their digital forensic science graduate program. And at the DFRWS meeting in Monterey that year, it was kind of the in residence where the students got to come and do their resident time for their graduation requirement. I was in need of a keynote speaker, I didn't have one, and somebody said, hey, how about Cindy Murphy? And I thought, no idea who that is. Uh-oh. Oh, it's okay. Okay. Um, and they said, no, she, she's great, she loves to do this, contact her. I reached out to her, she was very gracious, she came and talked to the students. And we got in conversation, and uh, long story short, we found out we had a ton of things in common. Not only were we super snappy dressers, but we also, <laughs> were musicians, and not only were we single, <clears throat> excuse me, single instrument musicians, but we were also learning to play another instrument that was not our primary instrument, which we thought was very interesting. And she shared and said, you know what, I think there are a lot of musicians among digital forensic professionals. Oh, that's very interesting. I, I've heard that as well. Um, and it was just kind of a topic of conversation, we went our separate ways, stayed friends. And but do you know the weirdest thing we had in common? We both played the banjo. Uh, the banjo, right. Yeah, that was pretty weird. Um, the third individual that you see up on the screen is a guy by the name of Matt Linton. Does anybody know him? Yeah, yep. Matt's awesome. So Matt used to be the incident response lead at the NASA Center, uh, where I currently work in California. He defected and went to Google. Their gain, our loss. Uh, but he and I were close friends. Uh, he is also a musician. He plays the fiddle, and or the violin, and the cello. And the uh, ukulele. What's that? And the ukulele. And the ukulele. Uh, and he and I started having the same conversation. He said, you know, there's a lot of IR folks that play music. Well, maybe this was starting to be a thing. And so we kind of sparked up this three-way conversation about whether or not this was a thing, and if so, why? So we kind of got the idea for some original research, a survey that we put together um, that we sent out to a particular sample. It was a, a purposive, convenient sample for those of you statistics nerds out there. We targeted IASIS and SANS and all kinds of communities that we thought might have DFIR professionals. Well, and one quick backstory. Yeah. There's a person in this room that also sort of helped us along too. Frank McLean oh, wrote yeah. this great blog piece on fiddling um, and DFIR. Where is Frank? Frank's right there in ah, the middle. There he is. And uh, so that was also an inspiration to us. It was just another person who had brought this up. Uh, we know Mike Poor often would come with his instruments. Um, Josh Wright also plays. So all sorts of uh, musicians. So anyway, we, um, we put out a, this survey. Did and anybody, anybody take it? Hands? Wow, it's Frank? real hard oh, to see. Oh, there's another yeah, one back there. Yeah, there, there's, you know, 10 or 12 people. Okay, so we, so we sent this out. We actually got um, 206 responses, which based on the size of our fields is a pretty decent number, we thought. Uh, and we started to break it down from there. And we found out some really interesting things. So the first thing, uh, or one of the first things that we found was that among the respondents, we found that almost 50% reported that they were musicians or regularly played instruments of some sort, which was kind of awesome. It, we, we found that number to be kind of remarkable, but that really didn't do us a whole ton of good without some normative data, you know, trying to compare that to the general public, because that's really what we were talking about, is, is there really 
kind of an increased instance of musicianship or, or playing a musical instrument uh, or singing, because we included singing, uh, among people in our field. As we did this other research and tried to gather these statistics, we found that ranges were estimated, different surveys, anywhere from 5 or 6% up to, at the very top end, closer to 34. Uh, but it, as you know, if you've ever tried to do research involving statistics, they can, they can be very dubious and they can be made to say kind of whatever you need them to say. Uh, and so we, we spent some time evaluating um, kind of the, the provenance of these statistics. But, but really, in the end, what it came down to is no matter what statistics we looked at, whether they were from the music industry or whether they came from the U.S. Census, um, the numbers we were getting of, of DFIR professionals who were musicians was close to that 50% mark where the highest, most skewed number we could find um, for the general population put it at around 38%. So there was definitely something um, different in this community, or at least it appears that there's a trend. And so we, uh, we wrote a paper about this. It's in the SANS reading, uh, reading room. So all the good raw data, all of uh, the research and, and backstopping and everything related to the statistics that we got from our survey uh, and, and why those things might be uh, is in the paper. We encourage you to read it. But one of the things we definitely want to talk about is what we came to figure out was an acknowledged and established link between science and music. And there's a huge one. So one of my great heroes, Albert Einstein, uh, we all think of him as a physicist and a philosopher, um, but he's also a major musician. And if you start doing a little research out there, uh, he's said on a number of occasions that his uh, little theory, you know, that theory of relativity, um, was a discovery of musical perception, um, something that came to him through music. And that may sound fuzzy, right? It may sound really fuzzy, but music is a language. It's about patterns. It's about putting down um, data points in the right order, in the right pattern, and creating something in the end that is a program our brains understand as music. So if you think of it in those terms, it's a really great analogy for computing. There was a very large study that we cited that... Uh, I'm waiting for the first laugh. <laughs> Does anybody get the joke here? Come on. <laughs> there aren't any musicians in the room, maybe. No, musical humor. <laughs> yes. All right. Our survey was wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the big studies that was cited uh, was a group that looked specifically at what they consider to be high-performing scientists. So these were Nobel laureates, um, members of um, Sigma Chi, and some of these, these uh, elite scientific societies, and contrasted them with just other scientists and the general public. They wanted to know what made these people different. And as an aside to their study, they noted that almost universally, the scientists that were most high-performing in their fields, uh, among which Einstein obviously would be one, they had uh, experience non-scientific avocations or hobbies that were rooted in music and art. And so they associated these very closely and covered a great deal of ground uh, in showing that not only uh, were these uh, high-performing scientists also musicians and artists, and that is in part what seemed to set them apart from the other non-high-performing scientists, but that their participation and success in these non-scientific hobbies were also not a function of higher IQ, which we found very, very interesting. Yes, I found that actually really rewarding, because I've said many times, I might not be the smartest person in the room, but I'm really stubborn and I'm really creative, and those things probably make up for, and by the way, I'm really, really smart. So, you know, many rooms I am, in many rooms I am the smartest, but boy, you get into a conference like this and you start to wonder, right? Like, we have that, um, that imposter syndrome that sneaks in for all of us, you know. Um, and this was very comforting to, um, to all of us. Matt said, thank God, right? Like, thank God that it's not all about that IQ number, that, um, that these high-performing scientists, the highest-performing scientists, something about the combination of creativity um, expressed through music and the science and technology um, helped them to succeed. So creativity was a very important word, specifically scientific cre creativity. 
um, and perception, which I know is something is near and dear to your heart, yes. how we experience the world, um, not only as a function of what we do as digital forensic and IR professionals, but also as musicians. Did you want to elaborate on that? Absolutely. All right. So really, perception is where it's all at, right? Um, so how we see the world around us, we can't um, look at any of those little MAC times or the capitalized MAC times unless we're able to conceptualize um, what those various timestamps mean to us, what the patterns underlying that mean, and unless we're able to creatively parse out the way Lee does and Heather does and Sarah does and Nicole does, um, all of those differences that might be a possibility, um, unless we're able to, to conceptualize the testing that's going to lead us to those answers. So uh, several sociologists and psychologists went so far as to say that the best scientific thinkers, those individuals that were most scientifically creative, were also among the best concrete thinkers. And they linked those two skills very intimately. So through the original research that we did in the survey and the backstopping we did with the uh, literature review, we started to think, OK, so if we uh, take the fact that we think we have a higher percentage of musicians in these fields, it's a very interesting data point. But what use could music be to us? So let's say you're not a musician. Why do you care? How many people in the room are not musicians at all? All right, there's quite a few numbers. Guess what? Okay. There's something you can do to help your forensics. <laughs> something fun. They call it playing, in fact, right? <laughs> yes, it's really, it's really nice <laughs> when you enjoy it. Um, so the second half of the paper, we shifted our focus to uh, the potential uh, personal and career benefits of playing music for DFIR professionals. So this comes in many different areas. Um, principally, it comes in uh, areas related to stress relief and just plain feeling better. It brain comes, plasticity. Yes, it comes in the area of brain plasticity, and it can come in the area of team building. Absolutely. So do you want to talk about the first one? Sure. Um, so actually, I want to talk about brain plasticity okay. first because it's on my mind, right? Okay, cool. So brain plasticity basically is our ability, our, ability, our brain's ability to develop new um, and unique uh, neuron, neuron paths uh, in order to physically change itself um, as we learn new things. And this can be active your entire life. So um, if you keep your brain active, if you use it, you won't lose it. Um, and uh, there have been brain studies that have shown that people who practice music into their um, elder years um, actually suffer less from dementia and can slow down um, the process of dementia. But once you've developed your brain's ability to uh, create those, those new pathways, um, it finds it easier. It's like any other muscle. Well, I don't really know if it's a muscle, but, <laughs> but that no, organ, but if you exercise it, it will grow. Uh, musicians have more white matter, more gray matter, um, and, and more connections between the different sides of their brains, um, and that helps us to learn new things. Simply the act of listening to music will stimulate that, um, and so one of the questions we asked was, do you listen to music during your exams? And if so, what kind of music do you listen to? We were looking for those patterns. Um, and we found um, a great deal of variety in what people listen to. And we found some, um, a surprising number to me, because I listen to music during exams, but we found some who don't like to listen to music because they find it a distraction. Um, but it's, it uh, has been found that the benefits of simply listening to music um, are there. But if you pick up an instrument and start to play around with it, if you do those, um, if you practice the motor skills that help you to learn to be a musician, um, the benefits are increased um, many times. Absolutely. It really struck a chord with me. Uh, on my mom's side, I have a, a really extensive a history chord. of... <laughs> struck a chord did, with you. <laughs> uh, history of dementia. I have a 92-year-old grandfather. He's deep in the throes of it now. Um, my mom has started to show a few signs, so um, that, that was kind of important to me. Um, as we mentioned earlier, one of the other areas that can help us, besides the brain plasticity, because who among us wouldn't want to grow our brain and be better at what we do professionally by doing something fun, 
Uh, but it can pay big dividends for us as far as uh, personal enhancement, enjoyment, and stress relief as well. If you are a digital forensic and incident response professional, you're in a stressful job. Even if you like your job, it's stressful. Um, for those like me in law enforcement that, uh, you know, I mostly do intrusion compromise stuff now, but I started doing a lot of child pornography, a lot of child exploitation, a lot of sexual assault, uh, a lot of things that were really tough. Shootings. Absolutely. Stabbings. Absolutely. Yeah, people hurting each other, killing each other. There's some really great quotes in the paper um, from somebody who, who described in gritty detail what it's like uh, to be a digital forensic examiner sometimes. And IR professionals don't have it much better. They're dealing on a daily basis with compromises and intrusions that cost their companies all kinds of uh, embarrassments and data loss. And in some cases, like the Sony hack, some estimated that that cost upwards of $2 billion with a B. That's a lot of pressure. So when we start looking for things to deal with this type of stuff so that we don't, I don't know, get divorced and push everybody we love away from us, um, we start looking for outlets. And there are plenty of unhealthy ones. You can drink and do drugs and go to Fight Club and you know all the fun <laughs> stuff. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, we happen to think, obviously, because we've found it, but playing music is, is a better choice. Um, there is a remarkable program in Wisconsin uh, where uh, Cindy lives. Do uh, you want to talk about Guitars for Vets? Since, yeah, so since he's your neighbor. Guitars for Vets yeah. um, were also warrior songs. Uh, Jason Moon, my neighbor, right across the street. I'm not sure what twist of fate uh, made that happen, but he's uh, heavily involved in this program. And basically, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs has staffed um, and funded um, studies about um, about PTSD and uh, and music, and specifically about teaching music and learning music, and how it can interrupt a stress response, how it can just cut it short and um, and and sort of um, act as a, a release valve uh, for for pressure um, in the middle even of a PTSD response. Uh, and how practicing music and learning to play music um, can help veterans um, to retrain their brains to turn down that stress response and to really help them um, not only make it through acute responses to stress, but also um, lessen the number of those over time and for some people even find, um, find lasting peace. So it's a really great program. It did a great job for me. I was in Kuwait and Iraq for 13 months, uh, and when I came back is when I first started being interested in music. It, it, it did a uh, world of good for me. Um, one of the last things it can really do for us when we're talking about uh, career enhancement uh, is help us build more effective teams. Um, and, and we're going to give you a small demonstration of that here uh, at, the, at the end. But um, in, in general, the team that plays together stays together. When you're in a situation where you can participate with people that you have to deal with in a professional situation, particularly if that professional situation is very stressful, having an activity that you can do that's very low impact, uh, emotionally, that's very um, easy to get into, uh, that provides a lot of co-sharing of the work and support, uh, it can have a tremendous effect on how you work as a team. If you're an IR team or an investigative team, uh, and you're having to deal with these types of things on a daily basis in your professional life. Sure, there have been some really incredible studies in this area too. Um, they've, they've hooked up uh, musicians to brain monitoring equipment and have found that their brain waves actually sync together as they're working their way through songs. Um, and their breathing and their heart rates all come together. Uh, and so if you're talking about, um, you know, good, solid, nonverbal communication, you're not going to find it um, much more quality than you get uh, playing music with a group of people. There's um, a, a wonderful quote in the paper that, uh, that I should have included here, but um, it talks about how music is the one time you can lose the pitiful me um, and, and really become um, part of a group and experience what it means to work with other people um, uh, in, in a team and, and lose that worry about making mistakes, right? Because if I hit the wrong chord, I bet Daniel over here has got the right one. Um, and his, his solid chord covers mine just fine, and it might even sound like I was intentionally doing some sort of strange harmony there. So 
um, a lot of the mistakes m musicians feel themselves make actually contribute to, um, to the, the whole of the music that they're playing. I mean, it, it, even listening to us say this now, it sounds like we're in a cult. It does. Right? <laughs> like, a religion, testify! Yeah, you know, you could be musicians too. But, um, you know, it really is one of those things that we just kind of discovered. I mean, it was an evolution for me. Well, I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a to, musician. To be this fair, awesome. to be fair, Google knows about this, right? Like, oh, Google knows yeah, about this. Yeah, they, yeah. they have invested in an entire building full of practice rooms um, for their employees. And so, and when we lucky, say when we say an entire building, it, it's not like a gardener's shed. It is a full-size office building. And when we say that it is stocked with instruments, it is stocked with instruments. You go into every room, every room, and there are stringed instruments hanging on the wall. There's got to be 30 freaking drum sets in this thing. And just every room is for employees <laughs> to go and take instruments and play and de-stress and do the things they need to do to be happier at work. We all know that Google's into keeping their employees happy, right? They get free food and slides from the third floor down to the lobby and all of that kind of fun stuff. Um, well, they also have the opportunity to uh, make music. And Matt and I play regularly. We try at least every two weeks, no matter what we have going on at work. Uh, I'm at Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. Uh, so we're right up against Google. We share a fence. Um, so Matt and I yeah. are still close. You know, and interesting, Matt, interestingly, Matt has told, told stories where he'll say to people, no, I'm sorry, I can't attend that meeting. This is my scheduled practice time during work. So th they really do, um, they've invested in, um, in their employees' musical brains um, to that level. So it's, there really is something to it, um, and, and it helps on all sorts of levels. So we definitely want to share two more things before we get into the little well, bit at the end here. Well, first, I've, I've been putting quotes up, and you've probably yeah. noticed that some of them are from musicians, and some of them are from scientists, a lot of the theoretical physicists. But I loved this quote from Jesse Kornblum. Anybody know Jesse? You should, right? You use his tools, I'm sure. Um, and he used to be a SANS instructor. So, so Jesse, the other day on Facebook, quotes, uh, throws this quote up and says, it's conventional wisdom, you shouldn't send an email when you're emotional or upset. Less well known, but equally valid that you should also hold off when you're listening to poison. He was listening to talk dirty to me and sent an email uh, and regretted it. <laughs> so. Um, so this, this is real, and it, it affects all of us. It's a question of whether you notice it or not. So uh, in our survey, we also, in addition to trying to get kind of the vocational and demographic data down and, and learn about how people in our field uh, play or not, we also asked some open-ended questions about um, do you listen to music when you do exams? Do you think music has an effect on the way you do your job? Uh, what do you listen to? Uh, things of that type. So um, one of my favorite answers to the question about how do you think music affects the way you do your job was somebody said, um, you know, doing digital forensics is like putting together a really good performance. It's like putting together a really good song. I have to be creative. I have to follow where things lead. I have to be solid. And people have to understand it. A good forensic report is like a good musical performance. When you deliver it and you're done, you want the audience to flick their big lighters up in the air and wave them <laughs> back and forth. I love it. That was one of my favorite quotes. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that we asked uh, participants to do is if they listen to music while they do their exams, give us their top five. We want to know what their top five songs were that they listen to when they do their jobs. And, and we're giving that back to you, by right. the way, as an extra bonus. So um, we put together at the end of the paper, and one of the uh, one of the appendices is we made a list of the artist and uh, song name of all the songs that all the respondents gave us. It's think, weird. It's very yeah. weird. <laughs> it's great. It's though. really eclectic. <laughs> I think we wound up with about 173 songs, and then we had a little addendum of like 45 more where people didn't pick a song. They said, like, anything by Zach Brown Band or, you know, whatever it is they listen to. Um, and what, Barney the Dinosaur song made it on yeah. there. A um, yeah. couple of things by Weird Al. There's always the um, smarty pants out there. Time, timey Kangaroo Downsport. Where, where, where was the Aussie <laughs> that was up here earlier? Yeah, we got Timey Kangaroo Downsport uh, made it on there. So 
Um, it's, it's in the paper, but we also created a Spotify playlist that's public. So if you want to go listen to this, um, it's, it's called the Ultimate uh, DFIR Playlist. Yep. Uh, you can find it on Spotify and you can listen to it to your heart's content. Absolutely. Anything else to say on the topic? Well, I mean, so much to say. Oh, yeah. uh, we did a um, one hour webinar and we also did the forensic lunch, which was another hour, or at least most of an hour. Um, in preview for this half hour, half hour talk. So there's a lot of information that we've already put out um, and we thought that we'd take this opportunity to, um, to share with you in kind of a different way, um, realizing that this is in a lot of ways outside of everybody's comfort zone a little bit. But um, I think uh, Lee Whitfield a couple years ago did uh, a, a talk about, um, about forensics and, and mental health and how we can support ourselves and we wanted to follow up on that with, uh, with the research that we had um, come up with as well. So we're hoping that uh, you've enjoyed this and um, then we're gonna go way out of our comfort zone <laughs> um, and do some music for you. Um, and before we do that, I'm gonna to get to the slide where we have the chorus because we're hoping, I know it's like church, right? We're, we're hoping that, may, I don't go to church by the way, but exactly. we're hoping that you'll maybe get inspired to okay. join us if you feel so inclined. And Frank, so, you got those bones out? Okay. All right, all so right. we're gonna invite Frank up. Does anybody, anybody play the ukulele? And Ishmael, where'd he go? I'm serious, anybody play the uke? It's such a common instrument. All right. Where'd he go? He brought his guitar and everything. Ugh. <sighs>